Hey guys, welcome back to How to Roll Dice. I'm Josh, and this is going to be the last of my Gen Con 2022 haul videos. This is going to be all of the new board games that we bought at Gen Con 2022. I've already done the expansions that we bought for board games that I already owned, and I've already covered the RPGs that we purchased. So these are the new games. Some of these we did buy expansions with, those will also be shown here, and some of these we have some additional promos with. I'll try to show those if I can, but some of them we've already sort of moved into the boxes, and some of them are just a little hard to show. Um, beyond that, some of these were also purchased technically by my wife or my good friend Bryant, uh, but because those are going, because these games are going to be stored on the shelf behind me and played here, they're basically never going to leave this room unless we're going to a game night or something. They're essentially part of my collection. So let's start off with a game that Bryant purchased. Uh, this is a game that he actually saw for the first time last year at Gen Con, but the booth was so busy and so crowded with people wanting to learn about the game and play demos that we didn't get a chance to circle back and really learn much about it. He took the time this year to, learn, to watch some demos and to talk to the creator about the game and was very impressed with what the game had to offer and picked up both the game, the expansion, and the upgrade kit for the game. So this is Eschaton or Eschaton, I'm not exactly sure how you pronounce it, by Archon Games. Um, we have played it once and I can tell you that however you pronounce it, Eschaton or Eschaton, it means the end of the world. Basically in this game, you and the other players are playing as cult leaders, attempting to raise up the most powerful and prominent cult uh, and to appease the Dark One, this end times devil figure, who's basically going to arise at the point of Armageddon and whoever did the best job of making him happy, uh, you and your cultists are going to sort of get to serve him for all of eternity and everybody else will Perish in the Hellfires. It's a really great combination of a deck builder and an area control, territory control map. Um, it's basically like if you took Dominion uh, and bolted an area control game onto it, and then the area control functionality sort of like feedback looped into the deck building side of things. It's a really fun game. We've played it once. Um, it's for two to six players. Uh, the upgrade kit takes all of the wooden cultist tokens that are normally little cubes and turns them into actual little cultist meeples with little faces on them which is cute. Um, and then this expansion, Sigils of Ruin, which we have not played yet, uh, is sort of a precursor to a larger expansion that they're working on right now through Kickstarter. Sigils of Ruin basically adds in a group of Knights Templar that are basically trying to shut down Armageddon and stop the cults. So it's almost like an AI common enemy that all of you have to deal with. Um, it makes the game semi-cooperative. Um, from what the creator told us when the sort of full expansion comes out through Kickstarter, I'm not exactly sure when he said that was going to be, but soon they're working on it. It might even be live now. Um, that basically gives you a fully cooperative way of playing the game between you and the other cultists fighting against this sort of like holy army that are trying to stop Armageddon. It's a really fun game. It's really simple to play. It's really simple to learn. It's got some really cool like style to the way that it's designed. It's very dark. It's very gothic or, or goth, I suppose. Um, we liked it a lot. Uh, so moving on from Eschaton or Eschaton, I will learn how to say it at some point. If, if by chance Archon Games happens to see this video, give me like a proper pronunciation key in the comments down below. Um, thumbs up for proper pronunciation. Next up, we have Mariposas. This is a game that actually my wife, and I should say it's by AEG, um, this is a game that my wife actually wanted to pick up a few years ago when it came out. This game is by the same designer as Wingspan, um, though Oh, I, I thought it was also published by Stonemaier Games. I guess it's published by AEG. Maybe it's published by both. This is a beautiful game. Um, much like Wingspan, again, same designer, possibly same artist, I'm not certain. Um, this game uh, is just almost too pretty, um, and it's, it's moving how nice it looks. So the concept in this game is that you and the other players are attempting to escort or to, to I guess, journey alongside a group of monarch butterflies as they begin their journey in Mexico and migrate north up into North uh, you know, America and towards Canada. And then over the course of multiple generations, because no single monarch makes the round trip all the way up north and all the way back, it takes multiple generations to go north and multiple generations to come back. And you learn all this by playing the game. It's actually kind of bittersweet because it's a little depressing, but it's also beautiful. Um, you're, you're basically trying to help them navigate north while populating flowers, while uh, giving birth to the next generation of butterflies and landing at different sort of like important locations along the route, and then making your way back down towards Mexico 
by the end of your fourth generation's life. Um, it's a it's a very interesting idea for a board game. It's beautifully done. It's very informative. Reading the rule book, you actually learn quite a bit about the real process that these butterflies go through. I can show you the back of the box there. It's a very colorful game. Um, lots of nice, bright color, um, high saturation pieces. And I like the way that the map is designed because it almost has the feel of a train game where it's like a loose interpretation of North America through these hex spaces with wildflowers all over them. We've played this uh, once so far. It was a lot of fun. Some of the rules were a little, felt a little fiddly. Um, for example, the cards that dictate how you're allowed to move your butterflies, there isn't a lot of diversity in them. And because there's a rule that says you can basically mulligan if you ever have two cards in your hand that are the same type of movement, uh, you, you always have so much control over exactly which kind of move you can make that that mechanic doesn't really feel strategic. Um, it's, it's too easy to manipulate. But it's not meant to be like a highly complex, like highly strategic game. At least I don't think. Um, it is certainly uh, a fun game. I'm holding this sideways because the box lid is not on correctly. I apologize. It's a fun game that we had a lot of fun with, and we're definitely going to be playing it uh, a handful more times before I make a, a proper judgment call on it. But so far, we like it a lot. My wife is glad that she finally got a copy. Also, this is two to five players. I should have said that. Um, it's a relatively quick game to play through. It's got some nice mechanics to it. It's not just moving the butterflies around. It's also collecting different sets of colored cards and managing which wildflowers flowers you land on and way stations and there's lots going on. Um, on top of that, I should I should note, my wife got this for free. Um, another really cool thing about Gen Con and large gaming conventions is that a lot of vendors, a lot of uh, publishers or different booths that you go to, if you spend enough money, they'll basically just throw free stuff at you. Uh, sometimes if it's a, a single game that you picked up, they'll give you a small promo that goes with it, an extra card, some, some modified tokens, something simple just for buying the one game. Uh, but in the case of AEG, I think it was if you spend over $100 and we definitely did. We bought two or three games there, each worth at least 50 bucks. They just give you another game. They just go, hey, here's a here's a stack of games, like literally a pyramid on the floor of games that have come out over the last year or two that are very popular that we we have some additional copies of. Feel free to grab yourself one of them for free to go along with the set of games that you just purchased. I think this is something like a 50 or $60 game. And my wife was just like, oh, Mariposa's good, mine. Uh, and we just added it to the bag. So really cool, really good stuff. Uh, we really like it. It's a very nice game. Just like Wingspan, it's it's just as, as nice a game to look at and to learn through uh, as it is to play. Um, next up. I grabbed uh, this hefty fella right here. Uh, this is from Pegasus Spiel. This is, I, I hope it's Spiel. That's how I'm going to pronounce it. Um, and this is Carnegie. This is a game that I've wanted to find a copy of for a while. It's relatively new. I want to say it's 2021, maybe even 2022. Here's the box if you want to get a closer look at it. This is, uh, from what I understand from having watched tutorials and reviews of it, this is a pretty crunchy game. Um, and one of the main reasons that I wanted to play it is because beyond being crunchy uh, and the style of game that I like to play, which is sort of like a heavy German style, style um, marketing and industrial like finance management resource management style game is it's got this amazing design to the player boards where the, there are these sliding tabs that come out of the side of the player board that shift sort of like what resources are displayed in these little windows in your player board. Um, it just looks so elegantly made and, and so wonderful to interact with that I just I wanted a copy ever since I saw it for the first time. If you haven't seen what I'm talking about, definitely go look up Carnegie and, and try to find a video, not just pictures, to see how these little like sliding rules work. It's just a really cool design for a game. And overall, the look and the style of game is just very right up my alley. Um, so I was very happy to grab a copy of this. This is still sealed. We have not played this yet. This is a one to four player game. Uh, for me, the one doesn't really matter too much because I'm not too much of a solo gamer, though I have at times. Um, this probably will be played with a, a large group of people, or at least a group of four, because that's the most you can play it with. Um, next up, also from Peg a spiel. Uh, grabbed this game here. This is a game that I've wanted ever since I watched the review on Shut Up and Sit Down um, by Quince. This is Hansa Teutonica. This is the big box, so it's got a handful of additional components and expansions to it. Um, I I don't even know if I can properly explain this game because it's actually kind of, it sounds dull uh, when you explain it, but it's got an insane level of strategy to it in the way that you're constantly moving around this one small board that doesn't really have a lot of locations on it. I can show you the board, but you can look 
it up online too if you want to check it out. Um, it, it's not a massive sweeping map with hundreds of locations where you have to strategically position your pieces in an interconnected kind of way in order to yada yada. It's a relatively simple board, but because you're all kind of constantly like intermingling with each other on the board, it's very interactive between players. There's a lot going on that you need to be aware of uh, as far as like what other people are doing goes. Um, and with this, we got a small promotion. No idea what the promotion is or how it works, um, but it's some additional stuff there. Uh, it says promo uh, bonus marker. Don't know what this is. Goes with the big box. Um, so that's cool there. Obviously, haven't played that yet. Still sealed. Um, trying to manage how I'm moving stuff from one side to the other. Uh, let's talk about this lovely, I'm, I'm not going to call it a small box, but smallish medium box here um, by BoardGameTables.com. This is Kabuto Sumo. Um, Board Game Tables always chokes me up because, not chokes me up, but trips me up because that doesn't sound like a game publishing company, but that is the name of the, the booth that we bought it from. That is the name of the company that makes the game. Kabuto Sumo is a game that I saw for the first time last year at Gen Con. And this is one of those games where I saw it, I had never heard of it. I didn't even see a demo of it. I just saw the box and I took the box off the shelf and I went, that's really interesting looking. I kind of want to pick that up. And then I didn't because I second guessed myself. Uh, and then, uh, you know, most of the year went by and then I saw Shut Up and Sit Down do a review of it. And I thought to myself, damn it, I could have beat Shut Up and Sit Down to a review of a game that they thought was review worthy. That's frustrating. Um, so anyways, I, I was back at the booth this past Gen Con and they had plenty of copies, obviously. Um, I did watch a couple of quick demos uh, or play, watch people play a couple of quick demos because they had one going on. Um, although I already knew how the game worked because I had watched the Shut Up and Sit Down review and I grabbed myself a copy. Now this came with some, um, or I purchased with it, some additional expansions and upgrade pieces. They are in the box now with some additional wrestlers. Basically, this is a game where you are playing as a beetle who is literally competing in a sumo style wrestling match. Um, I can show you on the back of the box. Uh, on top of this three-dimensional platform that you actually assemble when you first open the box. And you're using these small uh, wooden discs and different shaped pieces, which you have to slide onto this circular platform in a strategic way that it pushes the opposing player's beetle piece off. Um, so all these different shaped wooden discs and, and odd shapes uh, are being slid around on this circular raised platform from the outer edge towards the middle. Um, and as you're doing that, pieces are falling off, and those are the pieces that you get to pick up and use on your next turn. And the first player to successfully knock another player's beetle out of the ring wins the game. You can play this with, I believe, two, three, or four players, which is awesome. I know you can do two and three because we've done that. Yes, you can play with four. Um, the expansion came with additional wrestlers. All of the wrestlers have special wooden pieces, which are odd shapes, which are meant to represent like special body parts that they have, like a rhinoceros beetle having its large horn or um, some kind of like, it's almost like a special weapon like wrestlers used to have if you watch like WWF back in the day. Um, and so those sort of give you an interesting way to move pieces around because they interact with the more common shaped pieces that are like regular circles and things like that in an interesting way, how they catch them and move them and twist them. Um, it's a whole lot of fun. Uh, even doing 1v1, because it's such a tactile, three-dimensional, interesting sort of visual and, and physical puzzle, um, even 1v1, I, I had a ton of fun playing this game. We had one match that lasted almost half an hour because we were doing such a good job of counteracting everything else the other player was doing. We also played one game with three players. That was a lot of fun. It's just a really fun, interesting take on how to do a game like this. And it really well, it, it does a really good job of representing what it's supposed to represent. Beatles having sumo wrestling matches on top of a stump. It's really cool. I really like it. Uh, so anyways, beyond that, we have Genotype. Genotype is by Genius Games. Um, this is a game that I have seen um, around. I haven't watched any full reviews on it. I didn't know much about it. We definitely watched a little bit of a demo while we were there. We talked to the guys at the booth a little bit about it. I'll hold the game up for you here. Um, and Genius Games, if you don't know, um, it's exactly what it sounds like. Uh, they are very smart games that do a lot to teach you about the concept or the theme or the historical event that they are actually representing, uh, that they are meant to sort of be uh, an example of. And so the full type, the full name of this game is Genotype uh, Mendelian Genetics Game. I can show you the back of the box here, uh, which I somehow again have on upside down. I never do that. I don't know why these are upside down. I must have been cleaning in a hurry. Um, but this game actually is meant to represent the um, original 
original, I, I guess it's the original experiments that were done by an Austrian, I think Austrian is correct, Austrian friar living in a monastery where he took various pea plants and cross-pollinated them to attempt to understand the way that plant genetics were distributed um, using things like cross-pollination and, and in the interaction of different sort of species and the different features that those plants had with each other. Uh, I guess he's basically considered the father of modern genetics. And so you're using some pretty scientific um, techniques or, or, in, or you're trying to understand some scientific techniques like Punnett squares. Um, if you don't know what those are, you can look them up if you've ever taken basic genetics or like an intro to biology class, you probably learned about Punnett squares. This game is full of Punnett squares. Um, you're interacting with the plants by using things like pollen brushes and rakes to actually try to uh, get them to crossbreed and things like that. Um, you're getting bonus victory points if you successfully breed the types of features on your plants that you are attempting to focus on um, that you've decided to go after for some additional victory points. You're using different members from the surrounding towns, university, and the monastery that the friar lived at, like the, the other church members, to support you in your efforts. They give you some bonus actions and things like that. It's a really fun game. It looks really nice set up on the table. And it's one of those games where you play it and at first you're like, I'm not gonna be able to understand this because I don't understand the science behind this. And then by the end of the game, you're like, I feel like I'm a geneticist. I know all about genetics. Um, so it's it's really well made. It's, it's really fun. It's two to four players. Um, is it a one to four player? One to five player, I apologize. One to five player game. Uh, we've played it once. We had lots of fun with it. We're definitely gonna be playing more of it. And it's it makes me wanna take a better look at Genius Games because I've seen some of their other games over the years. I believe they have one called Darwin that's about like the natural evolution of species. Um, I think there's one about the Galapagos Islands. Um, but yeah, they have some interesting concepts in games, and if they're all as well made and as interesting uh, and nice to look at as this one, then I would definitely be interested in picking up some more. Uh, then we have this little box here, haven't opened it yet, Con of Cons. Um, I can't remember why we got this. I want to say I bought my son, <laughs> I want to say I bought my son a uh, rewriting, a retelling, a rewriting, reauthoring of H.P. Uh, Lovecraft's The Call of Cthulhu done in the style and art style of a Dr. Seuss children's book. Um, however, it does not do away with any of the actual death or killing that happens in the story. So be forewarned if you're going to look this up. I don't have that in front of me, but I can, I, if you're interested, comment down below and I'll let you know exactly where you can find it. Um, but I bought that for my son. I want to say it was Chaosium was the name of the company that was publishing it. Um, and I've already read it to him twice. He thinks it's a great, he thinks it's a great book. He thinks it's a kid's book. I just sort of changed some of the words here and there. And when we bought that, uh, I want to say it was like a $25 purchase. I think they just gave us con of cons. I, I think that's really all I picked up there. Um, the reason that I didn't say, oh no, thanks. That's okay. Cause from what I understand, this is a relative simple family-esque game is that it's made by Reiner Knizia. Uh, if you don't know who that is, uh, he's a game designer who's made some amazing highly rated games. I have several of them on the shelves behind me. Um, they are normally not this simple, or at least the ones that I've seen reviewed and discussed are not this simple, but I figured, you know, what the hell. Um, it's the same with uh, Uwe Rosenberg. If you look at his games, he's got games that are like really complex and intricate, like A Feast for Odin. And then he's got games like, I think there's one called Bonanza, which is one of the first games that he made, which is like a, a very straightforward kind of like like not a puzzle game, but like a, a like a word puzzle game. Um, so there's nothing <laughs> there's nothing that says that a really amazing game designer can only make highly complex, mature games. Um, and so I have Con of Cons now. I take a quick look at the back there. I have no idea what the game is about. Um, oh yeah, it says right here, Chaosium Inc. So that's, I think that's who I got the book from if you guys are interested in that children's uh, Call of Cthulhu book. I think they had some other ones that were retellings as well. I don't know if they were all HP Lovecraft, but they were all that like done in the style of, um, you know, art style and writing style, like that weird rhyming scheme that Dr. Seuss would use. Um, so, Con of Cons, we've got that also a free game. Uh, moving on, this was another purchase that my wife made. You'll see a theme here with all of my wife's games. She bought Genotype, uh, she bought Mariposas, and then she also picked this one up totally on a whim based off of how it looked, and this is called Garden Nation. Uh, we haven't opened this yet. We don't know anything about how it's played or really what it's about. She bought it because she is she was in like an outdoorsy gardening kind of mood at this Gen Con, apparently, because these are all the styles of games that she picked up. This one is by Bombix Games. Um, again, don't really know anything about it. I can tell you that it's for two to four players and it's slated to run about 60 minutes, which if you know anything about games, that means somewhere between an hour and a half and two hours. Um, and it looks like it's got some pretty complex player boards to it. It looks like you're trying to do area control around this little forest area. Uh, 
Um, there's a turtle with a crane on its back. I mean, you guys can see it in the top corner of the box there. Turtle with a crane on its back. Um, and it's just an interesting looking game. Haven't opened it yet. Don't know anything about it, but we're going to give it a shot and hopefully she likes it. Uh, whether or not I like it, as long as she likes it, I'll be happy to play it. Um, then another game that was picked up by Bryant. This is a game that he's wanted for a while from Pandasaurus. This is called Brew. Uh, this is a game that I actually had a little bit of interaction with the Pandasaurus folks on Twitter about because somebody had posted a picture of the game and mentioned how it was a little more sort of cutthroat than they thought it was going to be. And I commented saying, oh, good to know, because my friend is actually interested in brew, but he's not a huge fan of like cutthroat strategy games. He likes more of a passive like German style strategy game or at least a euro. Um, and so I was like, you know, thanks for the for the heads up. Maybe it's not a good purchase for us. And Pandasaurus jumped in. They were like, hold on, hold on. It doesn't need to be cutthroat. Like there are mechanics in the game that you can use to really mess with other players. But if you focus entirely on those, then you're not actually focusing on your own strategy. And so you won't win. And so that's not really a winning way to play the game. It's more of just like if you want to win waste your game just being an idiot and like annoying your friends, you can. Uh, but for the most part, you're going to be focusing on your own strategy. And so uh, he, I, you know, I told him about that and we talked to the people at the Pandasaurus a little bit about it. And we ended up picking a copy up, or I should say he ended up picking a copy up. We did play um, one match of it in our hotel room because it's not too big of a game, but it does take up some space. Um, in this game, I've skipped a few because I, I haven't known what a few of these are about. But in this game, uh, you are playing as these sort of interesting, almost like alchemist characters living in this village in a world where all four of the seasons are happening at the same time. So spring, summer, winter, fall are all sort of going on simultaneously. And you're roaming around the forest and you're collecting different like types of plants and and various elements and you're mixing them together along with um, using the powers of different animals that you tame in order to create potions, which you can then drink to have special effects and you can manipulate the land around you. Um, it's a dice based card based game. It's interesting. I will say that towards the tail end of our first game, which lasted about an hour and a half, I want to say it was hour, hour and a half, not a super complex game, but there is definitely an open window for screwing with your opponents in a pretty aggressive way. Basically, if you notice that somebody starts focusing on using a certain season card, a certain like a summer card or a winter card, you can basically go to that card or you can start interacting with that card in a way that screws their entire round up, basically. Uh, you can make sure that they, they don't get any of the elements from that card that they were hoping to get because you basically go in there and either uh, block all those spaces by like burning them down or taking them before they do, just basically making their plan go sideways right off the bat. And it's not too hard to do that. And in some cases, it benefits you just as much to do that as it as it hurts them. Um, so there is some cutthroatiness to the game. I don't want to say that it's going to fall out of favor with us because we've only played it once. And obviously, who you play it with matters a lot. I, I will say that I see what people were talking about when they say it does have that kind of like cutthroat edge to it, if you wanted to play that way, um, which is generally something that I find some of my players don't love, but we need to play more of it to know whether or not it's really a main component, a main mechanic in the game that you need to utilize. Um, up next, <laughs> staying on trend with games that my wife has purchased. This is a heavy box. This is the Stardew Valley board game. My wife is a Stardew Valley nut. She has uh, she has to have over a thousand hours into the game or something close to that. She's paid, played quite a bit of it. Um, my sister is too, and so are her friends. It's got a real cult following that game. Um, and this game, I don't know if you know anything about it, but this game was actually put out by Concerned Ape, who is the same person who made, who literally coded um, and created the video game, Stardew Valley. And he wanted to create a board game version of the game. This is actually hard to hold up in front of you like this. Uh, so this is a board game version of the video game that's meant to, as closely as possible, represent the way the video game plays. I haven't played much of the video game, but for the from what I understand, you're a young boy whose grandfather passes away and leaves him a farm in a small village. And you go around the village while revamping the farm and uh, raising livestock, growing crops, harvesting minerals from the nearest near nearby mines, um, making friends with villagers. You can go as far as to sort of build up relationships to the point where you get married to a specific villager if you put enough effort into that. And then the game kind of goes off in a fantasy direction. I'm pretty sure you can find like wizards in the mind and there's like an ancient witch's um, cabin that you can like go meet people with. I'm probably getting a lot of this wrong, but it starts off as something like um, 
uh, um, twi- what was that game? Something Moon, Harvest Moon. I remember Harvest Moon for like N64. It starts off something like a Harvest Moon, and then it just kind of goes a little bit like Terraria Minecraft. Like it gets a little fantasy, um, but it's got a huge following. I saw her punching everything out in this board game, and she was literally having a blast seeing how they replicated everything from the video game in the board game. And apparently the he, he Concerned Ape, did a really good job with, with designing this and converting one into the other. So I'm sure she's very excited to give this a try. I could very much see us waiting until my sister is in town to play this for the first time um, because the two of them would have an absolute blast with it. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's Stardew Valley, the board game. Uh, moving on to a smaller one that I picked up. Uh, again, this was kind of a... a slide these over a bit. I'm losing room. This was kind of a a Twitter um, trigger for me. Um, We were at the booth that was selling all of the um, Everdell expansions, which I showed in my expansion video. And uh, they were not just the Everdell booth Starling Games. They were not just a Starling game booth. It was actually like a Toys for Tots booth that was being sponsored by several publishing companies, game publishing companies. And they had a deal going on where if you spent something like uh, $100 on board games, you could get a board game bag, like a carrying bag. Maybe I'll show you that at the end of the video it's right over there for 25 bucks when normally they're 50 or 75 bucks and it holds like five to seven board games comfortably on your back in this padded bag with an easy open flap that allows you to slide them out it's really nice and it says right on it um plus one bag of giving uh and i'm pretty sure it's toys for tots so we were like of course you have the everdell stuff we're gonna buy that so we'll get the bag it's all for a good cause i also think every game you bought they donated a game to like children in need of toys or something like that so really cool cause um but while i was there there while we were checking out one of the the women that was checking us out she said is there anything else you wanted to pick up today and i happened to glance down the counter and i saw this sitting on the counter i was like oh my god set a watch like i i it had completely slipped my mind this was a game set a watch this is the deluxe edition uh that i saw on somebody share on twitter and they said oh having such a blast with uh set a watch you know them playing with their friends and i was like what is that and i literally went and looked it up on board game geek and i was like this is such a cool concept for a game how have i never heard of this like little small box game with such an amazing concept but basically Basically, you and the other players are playing as members of a D&D style adventuring party. And just like in D&D, where to get a full rest for your characters to recover HP and spells and things like that, usually you take turns where one character will be awake for part of the, the sleep cycle to watch for raiders or bandits who might come into your camp and try to kill you all. And this is a common trope in D&D games. It's just kind of like a thing that everybody everybody knows. That's one of the things you do in D&D. Like, I cast Fireball into the darkness. Um, Um, And so they based this game around the concept of, okay, you and the other players are going to take turns being the character on watch in the camp while the other players are doing their regular like adventuring type stuff like fighting bad guys off and things like that. So the player in the camp is doing like support stuff while all the other players are doing the combat stuff. And then every round, the player in the camp changes to a different player. Um, And you're playing as, you know, a knight, a wizard, a rogue, a bard, like it's the different classes from D&D. It's such a fun game and it's such a cool like way to approach this concept the way that they do it. First off, the fact is that that you open the box and the box is now the board. Like the inside of the box makes the board. That's really cool. Um, The deluxe edition comes with... um, several different uh, additional classes that you can play as. Here's the sort of default box, and you can see on the back uh, some of the components of the game. Um, I had never heard of this game at all until I, I saw somebody post about it on Twitter, and I'm so happy that I got it. We've played one uh, match of it. It was a lot of fun. Apparently, the game is generally pretty hard to succeed at because you have to make it through several rounds of the game without dying. I think we almost beat it, or we did beat it just at the end. Um, the only thing that I didn't like about the game, I liked a lot about the game. It's a dice rolling game. It's a it's a spell and a special ability management game. Um, is it dice rolling? Yes, it is dice rolling. Um, the one thing I didn't like about it is it's a one to four player game however you must always have four heroes so if you're playing with three players one player just works an extra hero and if you're playing with two players each player plays two heroes and if you're playing one player it's you controlling four characters versus the monsters Um, so you always have to have four usually when i come across a mechanic like that my first thought is okay so you built a game and then you couldn't figure out how to scale it and so you just didn't and you just made it a four player game all the time, but that can be played by fewer than four players. 
So I don't love that. It feels like a, a weak spot. Like you just gave up trying to finish your game and you're like, ah, I'm not sure how to scale it down to three or four. Just it's always four um, or sorry, three or two. It's, it's always four. Um, so didn't love that. But everything else about the game I loved and I'm very happy that I grabbed a copy. It's a very cool game. I really want to play this with more um, like players of D&D that I'm friends with uh, because like my wife's not a huge D&D fan. Um, some of my other friends are, are bigger into it and I feel like they'll get a bigger kick out of it. But we had a good time playing it. It's a lot of fun. I'm glad I picked it up. Um, moving on to this guy right here. This is The King's Dilemma. This is one of the only legacy games I've ever wanted to buy. There are a few that I own, like I own Jaws of the Lion, but for Gloomhaven, never going to play that. Um, there's, uh, I want to say there's one or two others that I own that we're just never going to play because I, I bought them because I was like, oh, they're highly rated and I'm sure we'll give it a try at some point and I have no drive to try it at all. This game, however, I, I knew it was a legacy game. I've wanted to try forever, uh, probably again since Shut Up and Sit Down did a review of it because I learned about a lot of games through Shut Up and Sit Down. Um, but this is The King's Dilemma. This is a game uh, that takes place over about 15 hours of gameplay. So something like 15 sessions, where a session is about an hour long. And you and the other players are playing as noble families inside of a medieval uh, type kingdom. And your families initially have sort of uh, drives or goals that they're attempting to achieve through their noble power in the kingdom, uh, trying to convince the king and other nobility to sort of sway their votes in certain directions. Should we go to war with this nation? Should we create a peace treaty with this nation? Should we trade with this group over here or should we excommunicate this group over there it's all stuff like that and there's a lot of like secret bidding and underhanded backside decisions that you're making and, and packs with other players and every round is basically another generation of your family the older generation dies off and now their children are in charge and so now you're playing as their children well maybe they see things a little bit differently maybe they have other goals that they're looking towards maybe they're they're viewing the empire differently than the generation before them did older alliances die, new alliances are formed, um, and you play through those many generations of those different royal noble bloodlines um, in this this empire, this kingdom. Um, I it's So if you're a fan of Game of Thrones, that probably sounds very Game of Thrones to you. Uh, all the power to you. I'm not a huge fan of Game of Thrones. I watched the first four or five. I, I watched until the Viper got his head crushed in. Spoilers, everybody should know that by now. And uh, at that point, I was like, this show's not for me anymore. It's just, it's leaning too heavily into the gross out factor. I'm getting too distracted from plot points uh, by how much violence there is. I don't generally dislike violence. I dislike suffering. And that show had a lot of suffering in it. Um, and it was pretty over the top gory. So anyways, wasn't a huge fan of Game of Thrones. Probably never going to get around to reading the books either because they're just gigantic. Even like listening to the audiobook, I think like one audiobook is 30 or 40 hours long. And that's the first book. And that's probably the shortest of all of them, right? So not a huge fan of Game of Thrones. But if you're a big fan of Game of Thrones, I feel like you would love this game. Probably more so than the Game of Thrones board game, which I've also played, which has much, much larger flaws to it that I'm not going to get into right now. Like I think it requires eight players, period, flat out, no more, no less. It's a weird game. Anywho. Really, really, really excited to give this a shot. I don't think I'm going to go for 15 separate sessions. I think I'm going to go for maybe like a weekend. Like I get five or six people over. I want to say it's a two to five player game. Yeah, two to three to five player game. I'm going to get five people over. Um, might even do couples if I can, but five people over to sit down and play all day Saturday and all day Sunday and just wrap the whole thing up inside of a weekend. Because it's a legacy game, there is no replay factor to it. I want to say it was like 80 or $90 for the box. You're going to get one 15 hour play throughout of it and that's it it's done throughout the course of the game you're going to be destroying components you're going to be marking components you're going to be putting stickers on things tearing other things up um, so it will permanently change the game you can't replay it but by the end of it you will have had an amazing experience with your four friends so very very excited to give the king's dilemma a shot once we can get that group together um, second to last armageddon I, th I think i'm saving the best for last um, i was the most excited to find it Second to last is Armageddon from the ground up. This is from Queen Games, and this is another free game that we got entirely free that we did not know we were going to get. I was purchasing the Shogun big box and Shogun upgrade kit, as well as I want to say I bought one other thing from Queen Games. I can't remember. It might have just been those two. And they said, oh, you spent over $100. You get a free box. You get a, you get a free game. And so while I was checking out, Bryant was at the stack, like, again, literal, like five foot tall from the floor pyramid of different games, trying to figure out which one to buy. 
and we didn't recognize any of them. And we were trying to like hurry up and move on to the next booth because it was the first day and we were excited. And he's like looking at boxes and flipping things over. And uh, finally, I was like, what's your system? Like, what are you, what are you looking for? What are you going for? Um, and he goes, honestly, I'm going by physical weight. Like how heavy is the box? And I like grabbed a few and I was like, oh, this one, this one weighs a ton. So mic check, uh, headphones off. Like, this very, very heavy box. I haven't opened it yet, so I don't know what's in here. Uh, but it's basically a game about you and a bunch of other players who are attempting to rebuild society from the ground up after an Armageddon type event. Uh, you can see the back of the box there. I can't remember if I'd held it up yet. But uh, if it is anywhere in the caliber or the range of Shogun, which is easily top three games for me of all time, it's going to be a great game. And it's a very heavy box, and we got it for free. So at the very least, we've gotten our money's worth, which was nothing for what appears to be a very heavy box of components. Lastly, and I know it's been a long video, I apologize. This is, and I'm going to try to say it right, uh, Teotihuacan City of Gods. Te Teotihuacan. Uh, I, I looked up how to say it at one point, and I memorized it, and then I forgot. Um, this is one of the top 100 uh, board games of all time. Several of these are. Um, but this is one that I've wanted to find a copy of forever. And not only could I not find a copy of it, I've never seen a copy of this in real life, either in a store or being played anywhere. Um, I've never even seen any of the other games by this company that have similar titles and similar looks to them. Uh, this is a game where you are playing as a um, ancient, I think ancient is technically the, the right term, an ancient South American or Latin American um, culture, like think Mayans, Incans, um, Aztecs, and you are attempting to build up this massive um, ziggurat style pyramid like structure uh, in honor of the gods. And in the process, you are obviously working with a bunch of different um, resources and you're trying to achieve a bunch of different accomplishments in order to properly honor the gods and earn victory points and things like that. Um, I don't know what it is about this game, but something about the look and the style of it, you, you just don't like I love <clears throat> I love like that that era and that style of culture that like native like native american but like south american or like latin american like incans and mayans and aztecs like pre like colonial invasion of the conquistadors or the portuguese um into those territories which like completely wiped them out and now there's just these like amazing mysterious like un like <laughs> un un unravelable i don't know how to say that properly but like uh, ancient aliens type stuff, uh, structures and cities and buried things down there that we're constantly digging up. And there's so much about them that we don't know. And they have such a cool like style to them. That's, uh, I don't know, just like the, the, the style of the clothing and like the head garb and all that's, it's very cool. It's very cool. I've always liked it. And this game has a very interesting mechanic in that the actual structure that you're building in the middle of the board, I don't know how well you can see it there, um, almost looks like a stack of, um, mahjong tiles, like these ceramic style, um, tiles that you're laying in the middle of the board as you're constructing it. And you can see that they have different symbols on them, which are actually going to have impacts on when they are placed and where they're placed in the structure. Um, or I, I'm not sure. Maybe, it, uh, maybe the game governs when they can be placed into the structure. But I have wanted to find a copy of this game forever, just based off of what it's built, what it's based around, like what it represents, the theme, the setting, and the way that it's designed. And I was at a booth. I can't remember what the name of the booth was, but it wasn't a specific um, publisher. It was like a store. It was like a store of many, many board games. And I looked around the whole thing because we were getting towards the end of the convention. I think it was the second to last day before, so probably Saturday. We were leaving Sunday. We were on the last aisle of the entire exhibit hall. We had gone up and down the exhibit hall two or three times. This was basically our last walkthrough. Came across this booth, a big booth, like lots of shelves, basically a whole game store crammed into a 10 foot by 10 foot uh, vendor booth. Um, you know, six, seven foot high racks all the way around, filled front and back. And there's people just scouring, just like looking for any deal or any rarity that they can find. And of course, I was doing the same thing, saw a lot of stuff that I either, you know, I was like, I can get that at home. I know I can get that at home. I already have a copy of that. Um, you know, oh, I'm, I'm waiting until the expansion comes out or they're, they're remaking this right now. I'm going to get the new one. And then I spotted this on a top shelf, like tucked in a corner. And there was literally a guy in that corner on the floor digging through like shelves, looking at games. And I just hovered over the top of him, like like guarding, like with my arms out, like blocking the shelf so nobody else could come in because I didn't want anybody to come in and just like scoop it up. I had, obviously that probably wasn't going to happen, but I was like so nervous. I was like, it's there. I need to get it. I, I was just like staring at it, like waiting for the guy to move. And finally, he noticed that I was hovering over him and he's like, uh, am I in your way? Do you need me to move? And I was like, no, actually, just stay right there. And I literally like 
leaned over him and like air dunked to get the shelf. Uh, I probably almost need him in the head. Um, and I just slid it off of the shelf and I handed it to the guy at the front desk. And I was like, I still haven't gotten to peruse your outer wall of games, which I'd like to do. Please hold on to this. Put it somewhere where no one can get it. Um, I'm going to buy it. I'm going to be right back. And he was like, sure, no problem. And he put it underneath his desk. So it was like tucked away. And I went and I checked the outside shelf of the store. There wasn't anything else I wanted to buy. I came back. He slid it back out and I picked it up. I want to say it was forty five dollars. And I don't think that's the MSRP. I think the MSRP is a good ten or twenty dollars higher than that. So not only did I finally find it, but uh, I got it for cheaper than it should have been. So very, very excited to give this one a try. I don't even know what to expect. I've just it's something that I've wanted forever. And now I have it and I'm happy about that. And I hope it's as good as I've wanted it to be. I hope it's as good uh, a game to play as it is an interesting game to look at. Um, but anywho, this is all the games that we picked up at Gen Con 2022. I hope you guys have enjoyed this run through. Um, obviously, as I play these, I'll try to do proper reviews on them, you know, back when I get to proper reviews again. Um, and uh, yeah, if you have any questions that you want me to answer in the comments down below, feel free to ask or if you want me to go over anything in more detail beyond actually like doing a review of it, like just open the box up, show you components, talk about it a bit more, things like that. Ask in the comments down below. Um, but yeah, other than that, I hope you guys are doing good and I will see you in the next video. Uh, have a good day.